Good afternoon. My name is Monica Nemeth. I'm a student at Shaker Heights High School and president of this year's City Club Youth Forum Council. I'm pleased to welcome you to this afternoon's Youth Forum entitled Carry On with D'Artagnan Crockett and Leroy Sutton, the young men featured in a 2009 ESPN feature story produced by Lisa Fenn, who also joins us today. Two of our speakers, D'Artagnan Crockett and Leroy Sutton, have shared a remarkable journey of turmoil, perseverance, and triumph growing up in Cleveland and as members of Lincoln West High School's wrestling team. D'Artagnan Crockett has been legally blind since he was a child, having been born with Leber's disease, which causes acute loss of vision. Despite this, he became a two-time Senate League champion in wrestling and an Ohio State record holder for his 585-pound deadlift. Leroy Sutton, who lost his legs in a train accident at age 11, also holds a record for his deadlift of 315 pounds. Together, they de developed a partnership and, more importantly, a friendship that impacted their lives irrevocably, making them brothers more than wrestlers. Former ESPN television producer Lisa Fenn brought D'Artagnan and Leroy's story to the world in 2009. After producing Carry On, the story of, quote, the one who couldn't see carrying around the one who couldn't walk, end quote, Lisa remained an active part of Leroy and D'Artagnan's lives. She stayed at first because, quote, I simply could not look away, end quote. Then, after five months of filming, joining the two in their classes, accompanying them to practices and on bus rides, Lisa, D'Artagnan, and Leroy began to build a relationship of trust in what became an ongoing bond of family and support. Following the release of Carry On and the outpouring of support that it has received internationally, Lisa helped form a trust for the two at carryontrust.org, which has been used to fund D'Artagnan and Leroy's athletic and educational pursuits. Their stories don't end there. After graduating from Lincoln West High School, D'Artagnan and Leroy went their separate ways, D'Artagnan to Colorado Springs upon an invitation from the U.S. Olympic Committee to train for the 2016 Olympics. Once there, his natural athletic abilities advanced his competition, placing him in the Paralympic sport of judo to compete in the London 2012 Olympic Games. Leroy moved to Arizona to attend Collins College studying video game design. Leroy graduated from Collins this past August, and D'Artagnan received a bronze medal in the 2012 Paralympic Games in London. All the time, the person who kept them connected was Lisa. Not only was Lisa in London to support D'Artagnan during the games, but she also helped to arrange a surprise visit by Leroy so that D'Artagnan would have his family there by his side. We are pleased to have D'Artagnan, Leroy, and Lisa with us today to share their inspirational stories of triumph and determination. Please welcome them to the City Club this afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bruce Hooley from ESPN 850 here in Cleveland, and I'll be moderating a discussion between D'Artagnan, Leroy, Lisa, and myself for about 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll throw it open for questions. We'll have microphones on the floor. Uh, we have name tags in front, but just in case you're in the back and you can't see them, just to make sure everybody knows who everyone is, Leroy Sutton on the left, D'Artagnan Crockett in the middle, and Lisa Fenn, formerly of ESPN. Um, I guess the first thing that I'd like to know, Lisa, is um, in your role as a producer at ESPN, I'm sure you are made aware of a lot of stories that you guys have to make judgments about as to whether or not you'll pursue them and take them to air or not. Um, I'd be curious to know how you first became aware of the unique story of Leroy and D'Artagnan. Certainly. Well, that um, credit actually goes to my father, who is here today. I'm from the Cleveland area, and he still lives here, and so he was reading the sports page one morning and called and said, I think you should um, look at this photo online of these two wrestlers from Lincoln West. And I pulled it up, and sure enough, there was Leroy perched on top of D'Artagnan's back. And there was a short blurb that this was their last wrestling match of their career, that they were seniors. Today was sectionals. And um, I had been a feature producer for, for about 10 years, and I had thought I had seen it all. But I had never seen a photo like that before. 
So I took it into my manager a few hours later, and um, I said, if we're going to do this story, we have to do it today. This is, this is it. This is their last wrestling match. And he said, well, what exactly is the story? And I said, I don't know, but I've never seen a photo like this before. <laughs> and he said, well, are they good wrestlers? And I said, I don't know. And he said, are they friends? I said, looks like it. <laughs> he said, are they articulate? I said, I have no idea. And he said, well, what's your gut feeling? I said, it's pretty good. Never seen a photo like this before. <laughs> and he said, have a nice trip to Cleveland. And about four hours later, I walked into that gym. I flew from Connecticut, and I met them for the first time. And that began, um, that was the beginning of our journey together. Wow, so I guess I had it in my mind's eye that uh, this was something that went through the ESPN process. Typically it does. As I said, I'd been there 10 years and never had a decision on a story been made that, that speedily. So <laughs> it was destiny. Typically then the uh, subjects of an ESPN profile will maybe hear about it a little bit sooner than you guys did. Uh, <laughs> Leroy, maybe you could take me back to when you first found out ESPN was coming to town to film your last wrestling match and what went through your mind? I didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> I really did. And, uh, actually, Coach Hans is over there. He's uh, my assistant coach. Yeah, I'm going to point you out. But, uh, <laughs> you know, the coach and Coach Hans came to me and they're like, yeah, they're going to come and film. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Your point is, and D'Artagnan's all excited and everything. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> but, you know, it really didn't like go through my mind that it was kind of a big deal, you know. Leroy was a, he loved wrestling, but he wasn't an overall intense sports fan, so. Mm -hmm. And D'Artagnan, uh, tell us a little bit about what you thought. Leroy said you were pretty excited to hear about it. Man, Sports Center. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Not even gonna lie. It's my first thought. Coach Cannon said, lady from ESPN is gonna come interview you guys. And I was like, oh man, awesome. Sports Center. But, uh. I was excited, but I still had no idea what to expect from it. I thought it was just going to be a couple interviews, maybe a couple shots of me wrestling and Leroy, and then that was it. Never expected to unfold to the story that it is today. Yeah, well, I don't think anybody could have predicted that. And uh, <laughs> as we get into that, uh, let's start maybe by going back and uh, giving both of you uh, guys an opportunity to talk about um, your circumstances growing up. I mean, this is a very unique story. Your friendship's obviously very unique. Um, and I think, you know, I think a lot of the people here today would enjoy hearing about, you know, your, we heard about your respective uh, challenges with uh, Lieber's disease and Leroy, your accident with the train when you were 11 years old. But I mean, your lives were, as I've learned, a lot more challenging than that uh, in many aspects. Leroy, you want to talk a little bit about what it was like growing up in Akron and then uh, as you got to Lutheran West. Lincoln West. Lincoln West, I'm sorry. <laughs> Lutheran West is Lisa. Yeah, Lisa. Lisa. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, but most, most of the time growing up, like, I lived in pretty much a dope house. My mom sold drugs. Uh, most of my family were, like, in the drug business in Ohio in general. But, you know, I never got into that, like, really got into it. I had to do it a couple times just to pay for bills and things like that. But um, I never really like got really into it. Like my brother got into it and right now he's in Georgia somewhere with somebody I don't know. Like, but it's it was like difficult because my mom would go on business trips and uh, you know, she'd be gone for like a week or two and it'd just be me, my brother and my little sister. And um, you know, most of the time I didn't even go to school uh, just because I get my little sister ready for school uh, and put her on a bus to go to school and I was already late, so uh, no point in going. Uh, but we, like, I ended up moving in with my grandma and everything, like, really changed. Like, my grandma's, she was the only one who wasn't in that uh, particular business. Uh, she was actually a security guard for Cleveland Municipal Schools. Uh, so once I moved in with her, I started going to Lincoln West, and that's when I met that knucklehead. <laughs> <laughs> and before we let D'Artagnan talk about that, Lisa, I think it'd be interesting for you to tell the story when in the process of doing, I think the first 
carry on edition. You went to Akron and, uh, and saw Leroy's neighborhood and there was an interchange between you and an officer from the Akron Police Department. Mm -hmm. Yes, I went to film the street where Leroy grew up on. It's called Laird Street. I went in the middle of a weekday and was told by the town I needed a police escort to be down that street. Um, and as I, as we filmed, you know, every house had sort of um, shady, sh shady sort of men standing on the porches and children who should have been in school, who weren't in school. Um, and my heart just broke knowing that that's where Leroy grew up, but, um, and the officer had said, you know, your, your guy's real lucky to have gotten out of here, because once you're born onto Laird, you don't leave Laird, you just hop from drug house to drug house to drug house, and that's, um, that's pretty much how Leroy grew up as well, um, and D'Artagnan as well, so I'll let him. Yeah, D'Artagnan, this, uh, this obviously sounds familiar to you, this is much like the life that you knew as a young man. Uh, yeah, definitely, when I, uh, cloud. Um. All right, there we go. Um, <laughs> like Leroy, I lived in essentially a dope house. My father was one of the customers. And uh, just, I didn't realize what it was until I was about 13, 14. That's when I started kind of understanding everything because that's when I had my first job and I had to help pay rent because my dad couldn't afford it on his own because he'd work, but then a lot of the money was going to feed his addiction. And he was getting it from right upstairs because we lived in a two-family house and the neighbors sold and distributed drugs like to the neighborhood. And uh, it's part of the reasons why I wanted to be in sports and not be home. Why I always I was a four-sport athlete in school, mainly so I didn't have to go home into that environment because that's just not something I wanted to be around. I never had to sell it, thankfully, because it's, it's dangerous, like being a part of it, and it's even more dangerous to have to go out and sell it. I was able to find a job getting paid under the table, which helped a lot, helped me build somewhat of a scheduling system, which wasn't quite enough. Um, the biggest issue there was uh, kind of, after my mom had passed when I was eight, I had split up with all my brothers and sisters, and so I wouldn't see them, and I was kind of an only child with just me and my dad. And so while he was gone, me and my uncle never got along because my uncle was... A jerk. I want to use that word, a jerk. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> and uh, me and him, we, we only got along when he drank, but I didn't like that because it seemed fake to me. And uh, we never got along, and uh, I just didn't want to go outside because there wasn't nothing but drug addicts and police and stray dogs around the neighborhood. So there was really no one to hang out with. That's why I always stayed at school, at practice. But in light of the situation, after I graduated, my dad, actually before I graduated, my dad became clean. And he's been clean for the past five, six years now. So D'Artagnan, you talked about sports and it gave you a kind of a refuge and maybe some structure too. Leroy, uh, if you'd talk about maybe how you got to know each other at Lincoln West and uh, why maybe you guys struck up a friendship. Um, first time I met him, I was introduced to him by a kid named, we called him Uno. <laughs> uh, and he's like, all right, you got to meet everybody. And I was in Uno's art class and he's like, yeah, you got to meet everybody, so I'm going to show you to everybody. The first person he showed me was D'Artagnan. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, what's the point of me meeting him? And he's like, yeah, he's captain of the wrestling team, and he, uh, he's on the football team. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. He's like, didn't you want to wrestle? I'm like, yeah, I can't do it this year. Uh, so that year, we didn't even have a friendship, like, we just seen each other in the hallway, what's yeah. up, here and there. <laughs> but then like the year after, that's when uh, my grandmother got better from her heart surgery. So I ended up uh, joining the wrestling team and like even before uh, wrestling season started, we had classes together. So I just like irritate him with in his that classes. Dude. And, yeah, with that dude with the face over there. <laughs> <laughs> 
You know, but, uh, I know watching your story, I think everybody was, was moved like Lisa was in the beginning. She talked about this striking visual image of D'Artagnan, you carrying Leroy. How did that happen the first time? Um, very simply, actually. People would say, oh, dude, it's such an incredible thing. I was like, just like giving somebody a piggyback ride. I never saw anything that amazing with it. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was heavy, but it was just concentrated weight in one area. <laughs> uh, one of our friends. <laughs> you call me fat. <laughs> Once again. No. <laughs> a little plump. But uh, one of our first wrestling matches of the, sh of the year, we, um, we had a bus, but it wasn't wheelchair accessible. And we're like, oh, well, how are we going to get Leroy on the bus? I'm like, well, simple. I'll just put him on my back, carry him on the bus. Does your wheelchair break down or fold or whatever? He was like, yeah, well, right, fold that in half and put it on the bus too. And it just kind of started from there. And then. Every time we wouldn't get a bus or there'd be stairs with a broken elevator or a shady elevator that we didn't want to take because we're like, I don't want to get stuck on this thing in this school because no one's going to come here to help us. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, the elevator's broke again. There's two people on it. Eh, whatever. <laughs> we'll get to it later. But that just kind of became a thing. You know, Leroy, you talked about your difficult circumstances growing up. I mean, to have a guy that you trusted that much, was that a, was that a stretch for you? No, I didn't trust him at all, because <laughs> I, I was on his back, I was on his back, and uh, one of our other wrestlers, Joe Pisos, picked up some snow and like shoved it down my pants. Oh. Like, and he did nothing but laugh. <laughs> I'm like, run, run, because Joe's like right behind us. <laughs> and he stopped and like stood there and let Joe put the snow in my pants. <laughs> and it was cold. <laughs> it was protecting me from getting snow put in my pants. So I mean, I was all right with it. <laughs> but no, I, I, I trust him a lot. Like once you like wrestle a guy. And ride him. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and treat him as your mount. Um, you're, you pretty fair. much <laughs> connect with him. Like I connected throughout like all of our classes together with him. So it was like we did projects together and things like that. So it's like I can trust him to do the work. And when we're on the mats, I can trust him to be serious when it's time to be serious. Uh, so you know he didn't have to like really too much earned my trust because it was already there. I so, think too because they also both have physical disabilities, they have a way of disarming each other and and being able to talk about it and joke about it and make comments about it that <laughs> other people may not be able to do off the bat or not know where the limits are, but that I noticed also became um, you know, a commonality that brought them together. Like the uh, first time I met Leroy, not the first time, but when I first heard about his accident, he's the one who told me. Most people's reaction are like, oh my God, oh, I can't believe it happened. It's crazy. It was like, oh, I got hit by a train. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> what? That's awesome. People <laughs> on the table looking at me like, you jerk. Are you laughing at him? And I was dying laughing because he's laughing. <laughs> I, I didn't laugh because I thought it was funny that he was hit by a train, just because just the magnitude of the story it was just a lot to deal with, because <laughs> you don't hear that. Like, I'm from Cleveland, you don't hear like, oh, a guy was hit by a train. You don't hear that at all. <laughs> you know, I think the sense of humor you guys have among each uh, between each other is amazing. Um, but we're looking at the finished product here now, after you've known each other for years and years. And Lisa, I'm curious to know, when you first met Leroy and D'Artagnan, like, were you received, I mean, they're very obviously open now, and you have this with incredible relationship with them, but I don't imagine that was there when you first walked into Lincoln mm -hmm. West. Uh, half and half. When I, I, when I introduced myself to D'Artagnan, he offered up his life story in a single Same breath. Um, <laughs> it was It was sweet. It was like he had kind of waited his whole life for someone to be interested mm -hmm. in who he was and what he was going through. Leroy was the opposite. His stare was icy. He wouldn't say hello. He put on his headphones and stared straight down. Um, and we, he and I didn't speak a word those whole two days that I, I was there. I went back a week later without cameras to try to get to know them better and figure out what exactly the focus of the story was. Um, I would follow D'Artagnan through his classes, and he was a really gracious host and 
I really enjoyed him. Leroy, I would go to his grandmother's house at night and just sit in the basement with him as he played video games. And, and after four nights, he still wouldn't say a word to me. And at that point, is that's kind of how I became endeared to him because I just, I knew I was being tested by him. I wasn't sure for what, but I was determined to pass. And I also just felt like he really needed a friend. And I was more interested in being that person than I was in, in telling a story. You know, I was watching a 30 for 30 the other night about Bernard King, and he got in trouble with the law at Tennessee, and his coach came and got him, and they sat in the car, and the coach said, I didn't say anything to him, and when Bernard got out of the car, he said, thanks for not talking. Mm -hmm. Did she gain some cred with you, Leroy, by being willing to sit and not hear you talk for, was it four days? Four nights, yeah. Four nights? Yeah. You know, it, in my life, like, there's a lot of people in and out of my life. Stop going in my pocket. <laughs> there's been a lot of people, like, in and out of my life, you know, they come in and they usually leave, like, soon after. Um, you know, some of them do it just because they can, and some of them are, you know, taken from me. Uh, like my uncle when I was eight, like he was my role model and things like that. And for Lisa to just come in and, you know, it was a very dire like time in my life because I had just struggled with, you know, my grandmother having heart surgery. Mm -hmm. So what was going through my head was, you know, I'm about to lose yet another person in my life. Uh, so when she came into the picture, you know, I just sat there and like I didn't really care that she was there. Um, but I was testing her, her ability to stick around. Like even though I'm not saying anything to her, she still came every, every day, almost every day. But you know, she was still there. She was still trying to start a conversation with me and things like that. Uh, and she passed the test, of course. <laughs> the flying colors. The flying colors. <laughs> so then after that initial ice was broken, did you still require maybe some building of a relationship or was that a proving, the proving ground was done and the floodgates It, it wasn't really up? like the ice was broken. It was more of, she melted away a couple layers uh, because there was, there was ice still there. Like there's still some things I, I don't tell her because I don't want to, Call forth the armada. Yeah. <laughs> it was a slow building yeah. in a relationship. You know, D'Artagnan, it was a lot faster. Um, but Leroy, probably still, there's still today, there's things I'm learning about him. But the initial, it's all built off that initial trust that we came out of that basement with. My understanding of your career at ESPN is that you've done. Not that there's any story like this, but in this genre of we've all seen the Chris Conley pieces and. Uh, the things that Tom Rinaldi does, and they're all very well done and very touching. Um, but when did this story start to become personal for you? Because I'm sure a lot of them you were emotionally invested in that you did. Sure. Um, I, I do get emotionally invested in my stories. That's not a common, um, that's not advised of journalists to get emotionally invested in their stories. But to me, the relationships that I develop with my feature subjects has always been the most fulfilling part of my job. And with these two, particularly sitting with Leroy in that basement for four nights, when he finally spoke to me, there was no way I was ever going to leave his life because I understood that um, <coughs> it just wasn't an option. <laughs> um, and the longer we filmed together and the more that I I came to understand their home lives and the way that they grew up and the needs that they had and that there was no, that, that, that they had family members who cared about them, but they didn't have, those family members didn't have any resources mm -hmm. to help them get to where they wanted to get in life. And I had those resources and I had the knowledge of how to get from A to B. And, um, you know, when I first walked into their, uh, I won't tell that story, but it's too long. Uh, it just kind of became <laughs> evident that um, that we were brought together for reasons greater than television. Um, however you choose to define that, um, 
that's the way that it, it quickly became evident to us. So the story first airs in 2009, and you have this overwhelming response from people who are touched by it and want to reach out, reached out to you via email and want to help. And Leroy and D'Artagnan, if D'Artagnan, maybe you could start by talking about when Lisa started to relay to you how people received your story, what went through your mind? How much people <coughs> were willing to help and wanted to help and wanted to invest in you guys' futures? Um, when we first figured out that there's, one, people out there that want to help, too, that, there are, that they are helping, it was just, it's kind of breathtaking because all my life I haven't met anyone other than the family who actually gave any type of care to actually reach out and help, <coughs> no matter how little it was. And although family wanted to do it, resources, like Lisa said, resources, money, was limited. So helping to that extent kind of wasn't an option. Like all people could offer was a home, shoulder to cry on, and sometimes that wasn't even there. Just. But you were excited. Yeah, I was incredibly excited that just, because it was a step in the right direction for not just me, but Leroy as well. Figured Lisa already had it all going for her. ESPN <laughs> producer, super awesome. Super freaking awesome, one word. Yep. <laughs> Leroy, uh, Lisa tells a story in a piece she wrote for ESPN.com that when she shared with you <clears throat> how people wanted to help, you were, your reaction surprised her, that there really wasn't much of a reaction on your part. <laughs> that was one of those moments where it was like complete polar opposite between me and, and Dar, uh, because, you know, he was excited and, you know, if, it was a big thing to him. And I'm kind of like, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that, that's cool. And then not even a day later, I was uh, sitting in my room with Dar and, um, and I'm on Facebook and I get this message and that's when it like hit me, like right in the face. This dude is right. He was writing me from Africa. And that's when everything just like hit me, just really hard. And I started to cry. <laughs> and Dar laughed. And then he asked why I was crying. And I was like, did you get a message from a guy in Africa yet on your Facebook? And he checks. And he's like, yeah. I'm like, read it. You're going to cry. And he starts crying. And, and, <laughs> and then I laughed at him. <laughs> but, you know, it, it really didn't hit me until that moment uh, how, how, like, inspiring and, and I don't know, I can't figure out another word. Powerful. <laughs> Powerful, yeah. Our story was there you go. until <laughs> that moment. And I think to your question in terms of the, their reaction to the opportunities they were getting, they were really exciting opportunities, but when you gr if you've grown up the way that they did, those opportunities, you don't even know what those actually look like. Mm -hmm. So I can say, okay, now you're going to get to go to college. Well, they've never left East Cleveland. They don't know what that looks like. They've never gone on a college visit. They don't know all the all the financial aid forms, the applications, the how do I get there, where do I live, like they don't even know what questions to ask. And so for me to deliver news of these opportunities, um, they don't have the, they didn't have the correct reactions that, you know, you or I might think they should have simply because they don't know what those opportunities look like. They haven't seen them in their families, and on in their neighborhoods. That, on top of that, I'm, I am a man of action. Like. You can say that you're gonna do something, but until it happens, I really don't care. Because like, <laughs> Leroy's seen a lot of disappointment in his life, and so until, until something actually happens, as he says, he doesn't put any trust in it, and I understand why that is now. And now we sit here four years later, and Leroy's a college graduate, and D'Artagnan's a bronze medalist, mm -hmm. and Lisa has I said she has two children, and she reminded me she has four. What are their ages? <laughs> 22, 23. No, it's two, three, three 22, 22, and then 23. 
So that seems like a good place for us to pause here <laughs> and we'll have a few announcements and then we'll open the floor <laughs> for questions so that you can uh, engage these gentlemen and Lisa in a further conversation. Good afternoon. My name is Celeste Kamasa. I am a member of the City Club Youth Forum Council. I am a senior at Cleveland Early College High School at John Hay and High Tech Academy. Today at the City Club of Cleveland Youth Forum, we are listening to Carry On, the inspiring story of Leroy Sutton, D'Artagnan Crockett, and Lisa Finn, moderated by Bruce Hooley from ESPN Cleveland Radio. We will return to our speakers in just a few moments, but first we encourage you to formulate questions for our speaker now while we break for a few announcements. Since 1997, the City Club has hosted the Youth Forum Council meet, the Youth Forum series throughout the school year. Students from around the greater Cleveland area invite speakers, students, and the community to four programs for and about youth. I would like to thank the members of the council whose names are in the program for all of their hard work throughout the year planning programs. Today, today's City Club Youth Forum Council is made possible through generous grants from AT&T, Pipeline Development Company, and the True Mart Fund. Today is part of the City Club Series sponsored by the Crater Cleveland Sports Commission, ESPN Cleveland, and the Cleveland Indians. We would like to thank our funders and supporters for their generous support. Please note that there are surveys and pencils on your tables. Please begin printing these out and we will collect them at the door when you leave. Now, we would like to return to our speakers for traditional City Club question and answers. To ask a question, and it must be a question, please raise your hand. As a courtesy, please stand, state your school and name, and hold your applause until the end of our program. Our microphone holders are Pierre Hurd and Marissa Thomas. First question, please. <laughs> Just raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. The first one's always the toughest, so who wants to start us off? We have a young man up here in the front, right here. Or maybe not. <laughs> my name is Jay Sean Whitehall and my name is my, my school is Citizen Academy East. What's your question? My question was, my question was, I, I, I'm going to have to tell my teacher. Go ahead, go ahead, ask. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was going to ask, Will, Will, was it hard? Was it hard to um, when you when you first when, when was it hard when you when y'all was it hard to wrestle? Uh, no, it wasn't hard at all. Like um, I just had to to figure out how to, um, and that's where Coach Hans comes in handy, cause he uh, <laughs> he searched it online uh, a wrestler that that was an amputee. And uh, you know, we pretty much adopted his uh, his style. And once we did that, it was it was game over. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Back here on the uh, left. Hey Banks, and I go to John Adams High School. And my question is, what was your greatest challenge wrestling? Which one? For Me? Leroy? Both of y'all. Okay. For both? both? Okay. <laughs> you go first. Um, my greatest challenge wrestling was... <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> 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 A lot of people would assume that it's because I'm legally blind. That's my greatest challenge wrestling. But actually it wasn't because when you're wrestling your opponent, you don't really need to see your opponent because he's right there and you have your hands on him. And... Because I was legally blind, I actually used that to my advantage to make myself more mad aware and knowing exactly where I am and where the opponent was at all times so I could essentially wrestle a match blind, which I basically did. 
So I guess my hardest challenge would be myself and like overcoming any doubts or fears that I might have had. My greatest challenge was the fact that I can like pretty much jump down. Like I can jump in between weight classes like easily. So I ended up uh, jump, getting all the way down to 160 at the end of, uh, of the wrestling season. So my greatest challenge was like trying to maintain weight because once I start wrestling, it just all just dropped off. Cause I went from 189 to uh, 160 within like a couple months. Next question. My name's uh, LJ Bentley. I go to St. Edward High School. And uh, I had a question for uh, D'Artagnan. And uh, it was, uh, how was like, uh, how was your work ethic going into the Paralympic Games? Like, how did you prepare for it, for one? And two, like, how long did you have that goal for to go to Paralympic Games? <laughs> uh, I'll answer uh, the second one first. I had that goal when they contacted me and asked me for it. So maybe two years before the actual Games. And the Games come every four years. So people usually train their entire lives to actually make a team. And half the time, they don't. So to actually start a sport two years before the games and then make, a, make the team and then medal is just unheard of. And my work ethic going into the games, after I made the uh, team in April of 2012, we went to a stupid amount of relentless training camps to get us prepared. We went from Colorado to Denver to Dallas to Florida twice, Boston back to Colorado, back to Florida. And by the time we got to London, I was actually sick of judo because it was just every single day, judo this, do judo that, judo this. And I was just like, I hate you, coach. I hate judo, I hate the gi, I hate the belt. And, but what that did is it pretty much peaked me before the game, so I was like in absolute tip-top shape before the games, which, which is ideal. And in years where there's not a Paralympic Games, he still trains, you know, they have practice four nights a week, he lifts every day, Yeah, we. so there's no off time. There's no off season, so uh, when you have school, you have like the wrestling season, you have football season, you have baseball or whatever. Judo, we go all year round, we have competitions all throughout the year, we don't, we don't stop. We'll have maybe a couple days rest here and there, like a break to go home but there's still competitions all year round. We don't really get time off. And that's with just about every Olympic sport. Oh. Hi, my name is Ariana Rodriguez and my question was for Leroy. Um, what did you go to college for? And was it hard, like, college? Was it hard? <laughs> <laughs> I went to college for... <laughs> <laughs> Video game design. I went to college for video game design. Um, the, hard, the hardest part about that was, um, you know, I didn't really have a school work ethic um, because if it didn't challenge me, I didn't care. Uh, but when I got to college, it was challenging because in high school, I just floated by because I'm smart and I was like lazy doing homework here and there just to stay on the wrestling team and coach made us do our homework and he'd find out from our teachers and then I actually had to try. <laughs> so with, um, with college, it was just trying to organize everything, you know, and to organize it for myself instead of having my coach there to, you know, go to all my teachers. Hey, does he have homework? Does he have homework? You need to do your homework and then set aside that time for me to not just like goof around and play video games all day uh, just to, to do my homework and things like that. Yeah. So Leroy, if everything goes ideally, what will be the first video game you design that comes to market? Wheelchair Man. <laughs> I cannot disclose this information. Okay. <laughs> Trademark information. <laughs> <laughs> you have to kill you all. 
But I, also, I just wanted to add, because I know a lot of you here are headed to college, and if any of you have grown up the way that they did, you'll, you know that there's not a lot of structure in your environments. Um, and that has been one of the biggest challenges that I think you would both attest to, is the, the jump from high school to college is being aware that you really need to learn to organize your time and your efforts, that you can't play video games when you have a paper due the next day. And probably even more importantly, if you're, having, if you're struggling with something, um, to ask for help. That was a huge hurdle that I encountered with both of them, that you know, they wouldn't turn something in or they would fail something. And I would say, why didn't you just ask me for help? I would have found help for you. But you know, growing up the way they did, there wasn't anyone to ask for help. And that wasn't a habit that they got into, and it, it's taken us quite a while to get really, over that hump. Really, really, really good advice. Don't try and do a five-page paper in two hours. <laughs> you will repeat yourself more times than a song. I, I am telling you, a Rihanna song. <laughs> she repeats herself a lot. <laughs> uh, question. Hello, my name is Tamika Hawthorne, and I'm a member of the City Club Youth Council. I attend the Cleveland School of Arts and High Tech Academy. My question is for everyone on the panel, and I just simply want to know, what was your greatest accomplishment from meeting each other to now? Uh, you want to answer that, Lisa? Okay. <laughs> 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 um, our greatest accomplishment. I guess the most obvious answer would be seeing D'Artagnan take his, home his bronze medal and Leroy taking home his college degree. Um, but for me, it's, it's been all of the little steps in between there. Um, so much of our progress has been two step forward, one step back. You know, they've had so many hurdles to come in terms of their education and just their life skills catching up in that way. And so for me, when they have those little victories, like turning in a really good paper on time and managing their finances correctly, I get just as excited about that as I do about um, medals and diplomas. So excited. Just, and quickly, I think the um, ultimate reward for me, as I've said before, I kind of just expected to help them get to school and wave proudly from afar. I never expected, um, I never expected them to love me back. And that's been the most rewarding, fulfilling part of this journey for me. Um, aside from watching Leroy roll across stage and get his diploma, and um, <laughs> roll across stage, <laughs> false, um, and winning my bronze medal, the biggest accomplishment for me is probably the impact that I've made on everyone's lives who I've interacted with and saw throughout the stole uh, my answer <laughs> throughout the years, because I mean. The metal being great and all, it's still a material thing. If I break it, if I lose it, I can get another one. It'll take a few months because they'll ship it from London, but I can ultimately get another metal. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't reproduce people's feelings and emotions that they get when you impact their life to a point where they have something to believe in and they find inspiration in something, even when they're in the darkest tunnel and there's no light, they find the littlest bit of light and they cling to it. And then they pull themselves out and it's because of your story. And that's, to me, is the biggest accomplishment that I've mm -hmm. ever done and ever will do. Like Lisa always says whenever we go anywhere, I'm stealing this from you, yes, that when we go to meet our maker, that uh, she doesn't believe, neither do I, that he's gonna ask us, you know, how's the last season of Breaking Bad or Walking Dead? I don't think that's the question that we're going to be asked. You're a thief. <laughs> <laughs> I announced that I was going to steal it. And uh, I don't think that's the question he's going to ask. I think the question he's going to ask is, how did you impact your fellow man? What, what did you do on this planet that was worthwhile? He stole my answer. <laughs> <laughs> But no, like, yeah, getting my diploma was great. Watching him in London, I was great. Um, 
But the thing is, like, I really built my family. Like, you know, I, I have a family. Like, they're cool people or whatnot. But I pretty much built my family uh, from ground up. And I have these guys sitting up here with me. Mr. Han sitting over there. <laughs> There's <laughs> Naveen out there <laughs> with the two kids, you know, like I pretty much built my family from ground up. Like I went from this quiet kid, quiet when it came to talking to somebody, but I was loud and obnoxious like all the time um, and still am. But, uh, you know, I went from this person who would never like break the seal and talk about anything personal with me to anytime I have a problem, Lisa's one of the first per uh, people I call like instantly. Um, there was a situation that I had and first thing I did was call Lisa and it was like three or four in the morning her time and she answered and that's what it, like really impacted me like throughout this entire journey uh i have somebody i who i can like rely on uh this guy like never texts me back i was just talking to him about <laughs> i do <laughs> but now he, he texts me back when it's an emergency but when it's like hey what's up i'm in training yo <laughs> <laughs> or eating or sleeping. And I think what he's, uh, just to expand a little, what his greatest accomplishment, one of them has been, is to allow himself to be known. That so much of what he went through in his life, he just felt like was, was a waste. Um, but now he's learning that so many other people go through the same struggles and that there is commonality and there is, there is value in the letting yourself be known and to let people connect with that. It also goes with something that Leroy said in one of his statuses a while back, and yes, I remember this, because I read, okay. that he said, um, before I was barely a speck on the radar, and with everything, with my family, Dar and Lisa and everything else, I've become a bleep, and that's all I could ever ask for. I can't really ask for much more. Okay, that's word for word, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Victoria Lane. I am a sophomore at High Tech Academy in Washington Park. And my question is for everybody. Through, this, through your experiences that you have experienced so far, have you learned to trust people more or are you still considered closed off to people? I'm gonna start that off so he doesn't steal my answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm still reserved to a point. Like I'll, I'll give like people a little bit of an in that way they don't have to, you know, go through what Lisa went through. And everybody here, you should thank Lisa for that. <laughs> but I'll give them a little bit of an in just so they don't have to like sit there and etch at me for like days and days and days until you get to the point where she wants to pull my hair out. <laughs> but, um, you know, I still have some trust issues a lot um but that it's not as bad as it was you know four years ago yeah you know we were recently in colorado and leroy uh, went out to get some lunch on his own and he came back and he was he had a real nice smile on his face because he had met a homeless person who was waiting outside of chipotle where he went and he said you know i i just asked him what his story was and talked to him for about an hour and Leroy of four years ago wouldn't have done that because I don't think he understood at that point that everybody's story matters. And he may have not known how to ask the right questions to get in. But um, now a big change that I see in you is because he has, he has allowed himself to trust people, as a result, he, he also sees how much he has to give. And um, that's been a really beautiful byproduct. And that dude was really cool. His name was Nick. 
uh, and he has been like all over like the uh, the east half of America, pretty much. <laughs> and he ended up there, homeless, uh, due to uh, one of his uh, his friends that he was rooming with was a drug dealer and ended up getting caught and he ended up losing the house. So he ended up on the streets. Uh, and his, his journey was just like completely amazing uh, because it all revolved around, you know, him running away from situations because somebody was a drug dealer or his mom was on drugs or his dad was on drugs, like things like that. And you know, you don't really, I never really thought I would go forth and, you know, do anything like that. But there was, there was something about that day where I just felt like talking to somebody. And, you know, I had to get my Chipotle first because I was hungry. <laughs> I was, I was hungry. Like, I had just waking up. Uh, so after my Chipotle, I ended up giving him um, about 10 bucks. And he's like, what's this for? And I'm like, well, I wasn't just going to give you money. You have to, you know, tell me a story at least. <laughs> 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 and, you know, we laughed. And I'm like, all right, man. Uh, and he told me, he's like, well, I need 18... He's like, I needed 18 bucks to, uh, to get a room for the night. And I'm like, well, you got half of it there. And, you know, shook his hand, found out his name. He knows my name. And then, you know, I went back to the hotel and waited for Lisa to uh, come pick us up. And I was, that was an awesome day. Like, I could not stop smiling that entire day. Yeah, because I think you realized, uh, again, just the value of investing in people. When you are in difficult circumstances, you feel very alone in them. But what you saw is that you actually had a lot in common with this person who also probably felt very alone. And, and in that stepping out to make that connection and trusting that connection, um, you, you found a lot of value. Hello, my name is Triana Osborne. I go to New Tech West, and it's for D'Artagnan and Leroy. Was it hard to maintain good grades while doing wrestling? That's pretty much the only reason I maintain good grades. <laughs> because for wrestling in any other sport, you had to have a 2.0. But for Hans, he wanted us to have uh, over that. He didn't want anything below a B. And so through my first half of high school, <laughs> that's before I really got deep into sports, I had maybe 2.0, 2.1, but I finished my final year with a 3.5 because I wanted to keep my grades up for the simple fact of if I fail here, then I won't be able to compete. And if I won't be able to compete, I'll have to go home. If I have to go home, I'll have to deal with an environment that I don't want to deal with. So it wasn't too hard, but sports was my motivation for keeping Keep myself, yeah. <laughs> Keeping yourself busy? Yep. Um, with me, it was getting past my laziness, which was the hard part, because any, any teacher from like Lincoln West would tell you that I, I'm smart. I was just lazy. Like If I didn't feel like doing it, I didn't do it. Uh, but Mr. Hans, Wanted, wanted our grades to be up, so I had to stop being lazy. And uh, I, really, I really picked my grades up, like, really high, because I, I had a C average. Yeah, I was a C average by the end. I was B. Let's try to get this little guy over here. He's had his hand up for a while. Can we get him? Oh. Is there a question here, or is he stretching? Oh, maybe he was stretching. Question on the side. Okay, I'm Victoria from Design Lab Early College High School. Do you think that violence in video games influences violent acts in our so society? No. 
<laughs> I am, I am. So, <laughs> I get into arguments online about this. I, I really do. Violence in video games does not dictate violence in real life. Um, if someone does not have the capacity to separate fantasy from reality, then they should not be playing video games at all. <laughs> uh, so if, prime example, there was a, um, a newsletter on Twitter about two weeks ago. Some guy said that his son got the influence from Minecraft to take a gun to school or something like that. And I'm like, Minecraft doesn't even have guns. <laughs> <laughs> and that is all cartoony. You have a sword, a pickaxe, and a shovel. And you're supposed to survive the night throughout a zombie apocalypse. That has nothing to do with a gun. <laughs> um, but other games like Grand Theft Auto and things like that, you know, I don't believe that those are those games that if you can't really separate fantasy from reality, you should really not play that game. But I, I, you know, I don't have a video game background, but I think that kids who are spending all their time playing games like that and immersed in that world are probably there because they, they don't feel like they have other positive outlets in their lives or people who care about them. And that's part of what our message is here today is, um, you know, if you see kids in your school who feel marginalized, who feel isolated, who feel alone, who, who are insular, um, those are the kids I would hope that you would reach out to, to get to know them better, to find out what their stories are, um, to invite them places, to show them the kind of love that they need that will serve as a positive outlet for whatever they're going through. Let's do two more, one on each side. My name is Oscar, and my school is Citizens Academy East. And my question was, was you elated when, when, when Leroy, I mean, when D'Artagnan uh, got the medal? Wait, was he what? Were you elated? Were we elated? <laughs> oh, snap. <laughs> <laughs> No, I was mad. <laughs> yeah, I was happy. Uh, even though I didn't want to let him come home because he didn't bring back gold. <laughs> but, <Anyway. laughs> you know, we were, we were so elated. That is a perfect word for it. Great choice. And the reason that we were able to feel that way, um, you know, when, he, when it became clear he wasn't going to win a gold medal, we felt a little sad. But then we realized that if he were to have won a silver, he would have won the silver because he lost the gold. But because he got a bronze, he got to end on a win. Boom. And that made everybody, we all got to share in that joy instead of feeling like, oh, okay, he lost the gold medal match, but he still gets silver. That's nice. But we got to end on a celebration, mm -hmm. and we couldn't have been more elated. And in judo, second place is first place loser. <laughs> be first place loser. <laughs> <laughs> were you happy, Mr. Hans? <laughs> Were you elated? <laughs> He's shaking his head. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's conclude our questions with one right here. Hi, my name is Nandi, and I'm a member of the Youth Forum Council as well. And I think I want to end on the note of what, what would you tell kids who may have been going through the same situation as you guys growing up um, as a message to those who may feel like they can't be as strong as you were in that situation or feel like they can't get out of that situation? I guess I'll take this one. Um, for me, it was not just a matter of determination, not just a matter of wanting to get out. It was a matter of having to forgive. And for a while, I was just mad at a lot of things. I was mad at my father. I was mad at, I was mad at the schools. I was mad at God. I was mad at the cards that I was dealt. But before I could move past and succeed or excel in anything, I had to forgive everything that was being dealt to me because if I didn't I would have just kind of carried the burden of anger 
and resentment toward everything and just kind of let it fester into a disease that would have ultimately and eventually like destroyed me from the inside out. And I think that's the biggest thing because a lot of people when I still see, they'll be mad at everything and will be so focused on the things that they have no control over and not just worry about the things they have control over. So just kind of stop, look at what's around you and what can you control. You can control whether or not you go to school. You can control whether or not you get your homework in. You can't control whether or not, you know, a family member is making wrong, de wrong decisions. Because if they're going to do it, they're going to do it anyway. You know, whether you're there or whether you're not there. Like, you can try and talk to them, but if it gets to a point where you feel like it's out of your hands, then it's out of your hands. You can't control whether the bus is late. You can't control so many aspects of life. But people try to control that, but you can't. Just let go and let life happen and forgive, every, forgive your situation, and I guess to say, just kind of move on. Well put. My name is Nick Rutherford. I'm a member of the City Club Youth Forum Council, and I'm a junior at Walsh Jesuit High School. Today at this City Club of Cleveland Youth Forum, we have had the pleasure of listening to D'Artagnan Crockett, Leroy Sutton, and Lisa Fenn in conversation with Bruce Hooley. Before you go, we would, like you to, we would like to ask you to fill out the surveys on your tables and return them at the door. Thank you to our speakers, and thank you to you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned.